A well-organized defense is the backbone for any successful team. And a lot of the greatest managers in the world owe their success to their attention to detail to the defensive game. The backline is often a very overlooked topic in football tactics, and it's easy to miss the hundreds of different choices managers have to make regarding how they want their defenders to move. From man marking or zonal marking, to defensive diagonals or offside traps, how a team defends certain situations can have a massive impact on their success. And in today's video, we're going to be taking a look at some of the basic defensive movements, along with some managers who actively choose to ignore these principles. Welcome back to Football Meta. Before we get going today, all stats in this video are brought to you by Soccerman. Soccerman gives you access to unique data from over 17 different leagues across the globe, allowing you to search and download all metrics from your favorite player or team. Thanks to their proprietary algorithms and unique metrics, Soccerman gives you insights into the game you won't find anywhere else. Each player has their own graphs and dedicated polar chart that allows you to visually compare your favorite players and help you improve your knowledge of the game. Click the link in the description down below to get started. Thank you to Sokoman and let's get back to the video. Now, quick disclaimer, today's video will focus solely on the movement of the defensive line. If you want in-depth breakdowns of team-wide defensive tactics, then check out this playlist here. To get a better understanding of the different phases of the game, let's divide the pitch into three zones and take a look at the main responsibilities in each of these areas. Zone 1 will be the opposition goal kicks and build up. Zone 2 will be the team's first fullback option, while zone 3 will be defending the goal. The first phase lays the foundations of a team's defensive principles, with all systems falling into either man marking or zonal. In man marking, the defenders will latch on to any striker and follow their movements around the pitch instantly closing them down as soon as the ball is played. The perfect example for this system is Gasperini's Atalanta, with his three centre-backs and two wing-backs giving no space to the team's striker or wingers. This means Atalanta often end up with a very fluid back line, with no strict positioning and often disregarding their teammates' positioning. As with all defensive systems, there are pros and cons. The pros of man-marking are the inherently aggressive nature of the team, instantly ready to put pressure on the opposition. This is reflected in the statistics, with Atalanta ranking first in the Serie A for interceptions, while also ranking in the top 5 for passes per defensive action and aerial duels won. On the other hand, the risk of this system are the amount of responsibility that is placed on each player. All it takes is one defender to lose track of their man and the team can instantly be outnumbered, causing a domino effect on the rest of the team. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, we have zonal marking systems. These systems have the advantage of being unfazed by a striker's movement, and the back line will move as a unit to cover certain spaces depending on where the ball is. Maurizio Sarri is a manager that has relied on this system for his whole managerial career. His back four start in a line and shift as a unit depending on the location of the ball. Independently of how many attackers are near the defensive line, their reference is the position of the ball, and have essentially scripted movements to follow to ensure dangerous spaces are covered. The pros of this system are that a team's movement can be scripted to ensure they know their positioning in specific situations, and a manager has more freedom in where to deploy his defence. For example, he can choose how narrow or how wide he wants his back line to be, how high up the pitch or how low depending on the quality of each opponent. The cons, however, are the constant communication that is required by the teammates, while also giving the opposition specific areas of the pitch they know will be free when playing against zonal marking systems. For example, in a recent match between Lazio and Inter, Inzaghi's Inter was aware that Lazio would struggle with switches in play, as his defensive line would always compact to the side of the ball, leaving lots of space on the opposite flank for Inter to exploit. This slightly more passive defensive approach is highlighted by Lazio's low ranking in tackles and interceptions, but with one of the best XGs against in the league, showing how this system can slowly cancel out any danger and force the opposition into a mistake. To easily understand the main differences, here's a quick breakdown of the main priorities for each system. In man marking, the order of priority is the ball, the opponent, the goal, and finally your teammate. In zonal marking, the first priority is the ball, followed by the goal, your teammate, and finally the position of the opponent. So these two systems are overarching over every subsequent defensive decision. And when the opposition moves into zone two is when we can start to see the main differences in how teams choose to defend. In the second phase, the backline is now more actively involved in play, and we can introduce the concept of the ball being playable or unplayable. 
With teams using man marking, the principles remain the same even in this area of the pitch, while for zonal marking there are a few differences. The general rule of thumb for the defensive line to follow is to drop back if the opposition has the ball in a playable position, while to move up if the ball is in an unplayable position. The defense's main priority is to cover the space in behind, to stop the strikers being one-on-one -on -one with the keeper. And so just before the ball is played, the defense will drop back to intercept any balls over the top. The fullback option on these passes forward can vary greatly from manager to manager. Let's say a ball is played forward into the striker. The typical defensive structure is the 1-3. One player goes for the ball, while the other three defenders move into a deeper, more narrow shape to stop any potential flick-ons and force the opposition to move the ball out wide. At higher levels and in teams that like to keep more attacking lines such as Bayern Munich, it's common for just two defenders to provide cover, with one of the fullbacks staying slightly further up the pitch. Or in some cases such as Atalanta, even just one defender providing cover, with the others adhering to their strict man-marking roles. But there are teams that choose to ignore these principles, an example of which is Jurgen Klopp's Liverpool. It's common for the Liverpool defenders to hold an exceptionally high line, and when the opposition has the ball in a playable situation, they don't cover the space in behind, but rather push up a few steps in an attempt to catch the strikers offside. Last season, Liverpool caught the opposition offside over 100 times, 40 times more than any other team. The pros of this are certainly energy expenditure, needed for their aggressive high-pressing system, but the cons are that it requires the team to be constantly in line, or they could end up being caught in behind, something that seems to be happening more and more frequently this season. Nonetheless, eventually all teams will need to fall back to provide cover. With the opposition moving in from the flank, the defending team will often adopt a similar 1-3 structure, with the fullback closing down the player on the ball, and the other three defenders forming a line in a slightly deeper position. But even this can vary greatly depending on the team, and the distance from the goal. The shape can vary from a flat three, a diagonal, or an inverted diagonal, with each of these having very clear pros and cons. The flat three is arguably the most common and provides immediate cover for the fullback, while also keeping the line as high as possible to limit the amount of depth the opposition has to play with. The cons are that if the fullback is beaten, the centre back now has little cover in case there is a run in behind. Here's an example of Atletico Madrid using the flat three as cover. It keeps the opposition away from the box, with the main threat being a ball into this position being harder to cover. Secondly, the diagonal has certainly fallen out of favour in recent years, with it being considered as a system that gives too much space for the attackers to exploit. In this system, each defender is covered by the player behind them, meaning it's harder to find gaps in the half spaces. The compromise is that it allows the opposition to get slightly closer to the goal line. It's harder to find gaps between the players, but it could also leave the fullback exposed on the opposite flank, as quick switches in play mean he has no cover behind him. The third method is arguably the more offensive of the three, and that is the inverted diagonal. In this case, the fullback steps out to cover, and the three defenders will be in a diagonal line, but with the opposite fullback being further up the pitch than the two centre-backs. This keeps the defensive line high while also limiting the space between defence and midfield to quickly close down any central options. The risk being that there is no cover if the ball is played into the space behind the back line. A team that uses this method frequently is Borussia Dortmund, with the fullback on the opposite flank moving inside to box in the opponent. Teams with quicker, more versatile fullbacks can rely more heavily on this shape. So it's important to note that the vast majority of these defensive choices only apply to zonal marking systems with man-marking teams keeping the opposition's positioning as a reference. But when entering the final third, even the strictest of man-marking teams will take a page out of zonal marking principles. As teams move closer and closer to the goal, managers will have different requirements on where the defenders should be positioned. From direct crosses into the box, once again man-marking systems will latch on to any striker and attempt to win the aerial duel. However, relying on winning all these duels is a very risky process and most teams will shift to some degree of zonal marking to cover dangerous spaces. The most important position to cover is the front post. Let's say the fullback has stepped out to cover. The first centre-back will position himself in a way that the ball cannot go between him and the goalkeeper, roughly speaking on the six-yard box, slightly in front of the goalpost. The other two defenders will either man-mark the strikers and attempt to win the aerial duel, or maintain their zonal marking principles and adopt a specific position. The most common is the three defenders in a line across the six-yard box, and will attack the cross moving up the pitch. 
managers such as Sarri will adopt the triangle shape with the central player of the three stepping slightly further up relying more on the goalkeeper and having more central cover. While if the delivery into the box is coming from the touchline, the line will often shift into an inverted diagonal to give the goalkeeper more breathing room and have more cover on the back post. The pros of zonal marking in the box are that the most dangerous areas are covered, while the cons are that if any player is beaten then the striker will have a free chance at goal. On the other hand, man marking ensures the strikers are all covered, but there is little cover on the front post and so it's harder for the defence to prevent the ball reaching the striker in the first place. So, obviously, the rest of the team will need to help out to completely prevent any goal-scoring opportunity. However, if the defence is not correctly positioned, it makes the whole team's job a lot harder. And there you have it. These are the basic defensive movements that the majority of teams will adhere to. So next time you're watching a match, make sure to check out how your defenders move, and leave a comment down below if they do anything new. If you enjoyed this video, why not check out this video on expected goals and how it led to the increase of crosses and cutbacks in the modern game. As always, if you enjoyed this content, then please leave a like and subscribe for more. Thanks for watching.